Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this instructional and engaging cooking show. Today on the show we have a well-known local chef. His name is Chef Manny Sifnugal and he is chef and owner of Masona Grill. He visited us today and he's going to be making two special dishes. To your right we have shrimp and avocado timbal with a spicy mayo and cilantro. And over to your left, we have a pork tenderloin with black bean, taku taku, and sweet plantains. So let's go over to Joe and Manny at the Sons of Italy Hall in Rosendale to learn how to make these delicious dishes. Hi, I'm Chef Joe Murphy from the Chef's Table series, television show. This show is produced by the Chef's Table Foundation. And we're really pleased today. We have a great chef. I've known Chef for probably seven, eight years now. And he has a wonderful following. Uh, he is the chef owner of Masona Grill in West Roxbury. And I'd like to welcome Chef Manny Sif Sifnagal, excuse me. That's good. And, yeah, and uh, so today, Chef, you're cooking a pork dish? We are. That's our main main course, yes. Okay, and first you're going to make a... We're going to a little shrimp and uh, avocado and beet timbal. Timbal is basically just in a cylinder, so it holds its shape and it's, nice. it's dexterous. Yeah. yeah, great. That sounds wonderful. And we do have a live audience, so uh, we're hoping that they enjoy the show as well as you and we might as well get rolling because we have a few different dishes we're going to make as we just said. Absolutely. So what are we going to do first, Chef? So first, uh, I thought, I mean, when I emailed Carol, I thought that you guys will have the recipes in front of you so you can see what we're doing because right. the stuff is already prepped ahead of the game. Okay. So the first dish is a shrimp timbal, I said, with avocado, right. beets, red onions, okay. a little uh, hot mayo that has a little Peruvian hot sauce, ketchup and mayo, and a little dash of lime juice. So Excellent. I do have all the ingredients already cut up, That's and I fine. will put them in a bowl and toss them all together, and I'll plate one dish for them to look at, yeah. and then we'll eat it later. Good. Okay, so. That sounds good. Again. Chef, let me ask you a question. A Peruvian hot sauce. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is that? They just peppers or hot Yeah, pepper? they're hot peppers, yeah, okay. with a little bit of vinegar, yeah. But oh. they're very nice and hot. Yes. Okay. Is that common in the Peruvian <laughs> culture, hot sauce? Very spicy? common. When you, were, when you were a kid, if you behave bad, that's what they gave you, a little pepper to put in your mouth. Ah, okay. No soap, it was pepper. All right. All right, so we have some cooked shrimp. Yeah. That, you know, it's been cooked lightly, you know, in some <coughs> boiling water, and then chop. No, no, uh, no shells, no tails. Oops. And then again, we have the avocados here. All right. So we're gonna just mix it all up. This is about six avocados and about two and a half pounds of shrimp. Okay. Then we have about four large beets that were diced also as well into Try to be the same size and consistently size. Okay, let me ask you a question about the beets. Yeah. Did, were these uh, a canned bean? No, no, they're fresh beets. Roasted? That were, no, we actually boiled them. Boiled. Roast them. I mean, some people roast beets, but I don't think the flavor really gets any better than if you boil them. Okay. Roasting them can take a lot longer, and it's hard because some of them are different than others in sizes size. per se, and they, one will be done, the other one will not be done. So I like the idea of like boiling them and peel them after too, okay. you know, when they're hot. Right. Chef, uh, Chef just gave you a, a great tip. <clears throat> if you're using a fresh beet, you know, some, some people will roast them, but his point is that they're not uniform in size, so it's better to boil them. Now, do you take the skin off? No, we take the skin after it's boiled. After it's boiled. Usually when they're slight, I mean, they're still warm, the skin yeah. just comes right off. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, All right so we're going to add some red onion as well. Yeah. Red onion is one of my favorite vegetables uh -huh. in any way, shape, or form. Okay. We're going to season with a little bit of salt, and we use kosher salt. Right. It has a better grain to it and yeah. much more flavor than the regular right. table salt. Yeah, and we talk about the difference between salt 
you know, a kosher salt is a much larger crystal than what you're typically using in the home, a table salt. And by volume, they have the same sodium content. But because of the larger crystal, I personally believe it does have a better flavor. It does, it does. And you get enough of that flavor enhancer using less uh, salt with the kosher. So, uh, and that's what you'll find in, in uh, professional kitchens. You may find sea salt sometimes, some chefs prefer that. But you'll never see table salt. All right, so we're lightly tossing it just so we can see where it's distributed. If you add the mayo first, then it can, mayo will hold on to a certain particular product and it will just be all avocado on one side and all beets. So just mix it up first. That's so that way, great tip, So Chef that way, you know, like you, um, you're really spreading it around and right. you see what you're going to throw the mayo in. Right. Yeah, you know, I was making tuna a week ago, and I did what you said don't do. And I, after I did it, you had a mayo sandwich. To get everything, yeah, exactly. You know, there were clumps of celery and onion, and then other parts didn't have it. So, also where I come from, I mean, you can actually make this completely vegetarian, and they use actually diced potato and diced carrot too. Oh. For some reason, it's called the Russian salad. I don't know why this would be Russian, but. Maybe because it's Russian dressing, like the tomato and ketchup thing. That's in Peru. Yeah. Great. All right, so I do have the mayo already made. Okay. And as I said, you can use any hot sauce. It could be Tabasco. It could be any of your, so of your choice. Right. And I usually like to ask a little bit at a time yeah. because, you know, mayonnaise can be a little fatty, I guess. Right. I want to talk about uh, the amount of heat. You know, cooking really is a form, a creative form. So if your guest or family likes a lot of heat, you adjust. If you don't like much heat, you just want to add that extra yeah. layer in there. So you can adjust. And you know, a chef who was talking about the recipe, uh, we do have that and it will be available online so that you can actually take your laptop, or your, uh, your pad and cook with the chef, have the recipe. And one thing I didn't talk about, which I m disappointed, mise en place, everything in its place. Every good chef has everything ready and that way there you don't forget an ingredient, but it also makes your cooking experience far more enjoyable. Absolutely. And I'm using a spatula too, just so you don't, the avocado will be the softest thing here. So if you use the spoon or you get into it too hard, the avocado will just become right. mush, you know? So you're doing a folding technique. Correct, yeah. And then we, I just squeezed, limes today are pretty big. So, you know, usually it's a whole lime, but I just did a half a lime, just to add a little sink to it. Mm -hmm. Now I want to give a shout out to uh, microgreens that are just amazing. And this right. is like fresh cilantro shoots. Mm. So we're also gonna put some cilantro in here. Mm -hmm. Look at this, even seeds in here. Wow. So you're sourcing from local? Yeah, we are sourcing from all kinds of different farms. Yeah, that, at least that's three. Great. At least three farms, yes. Yeah. You know, and fresh makes a huge difference in your cooking. So. Absolutely, yeah. So once again, we're gonna just toss that cilantro. Mm -hmm. Now, with the amount of heat that you like to use, is it enough to punish me if I get out of line? You good old Irishman, yeah, probably. No. <laughs> yeah, You'll be you know, sweating, yeah. I said this last week, I think, in the show, I, I'm American, oh, but okay. Irish descent, and we're not used to these heavy spices. You know, everything is in moderation. Right. You can always add more heat. I believe that it's not super spicy, but again, you know, I am, I love spicy, so. Right. All right, so we're gonna plate this dish like the way we'll do it in the restaurant. So you like spice. Yeah. So you were probably a fresh kid, so you got oh, big was. doses of that, right? I most likely was, yeah. yes. And still I'm. So this, this, this um, technique that I'm using, using the cylinder, that's what is called a timbal. Mm -hmm. Timbale in, in Italian means cylinder. So, I'm guessing that 
is about an inch and a half tall. Yeah. If you wanted to try use this for a presentation, you didn't want to spend the money, get a small tuna can. Yeah, you open it on both sides. That's both exactly sides, what you do. It'll do the same thing yeah. for you. So basically, when you pull it up, it just stays in that shape. Beautiful. And then you put a couple more herbies. Yeah. Yeah. You and know, then this you're is gonna just throw a little olive oil just for color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what's that? Just olive oil. Right. And a little more pepper just yeah. for the plate. And if you want to get fancy, a little paprika on the plate too. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Right. And, and you know, as you view this, you can see presentation counts. Oh yeah. Uh, it really, if you want to do something special with your family or friends, this is a, a great way to get the wow factor. Okay, chef, uh, we're going to start our second dish, and why don't you explain what we have here? Well, we have a little more complex dish. Uh, we're going to sear a pork tenderloin. It's going to be served with a black bean and rice taku taku. Taku taku is a rice and bean cake that is crisp on a Teflon pan, so it's kind of crunchy on the outside. We're gonna also saute a couple of uh, ripe plantains that are called maduros, they're pretty sweet, and a little pickled onion right on top. Nice. So we're gonna start first marinating the pork. I already have a piece here that has been marinated, so that's the one I'm gonna cook, but I'll show you the marinade because it's quite interesting. So about a half a cup of um, red vinegar, and we have some brown sugar here. So we put a couple of pieces of brown sugar. And brown sugar and vinegar, actually. The vinegar makes the brown sugar dissolve pretty quickly. Is that because it's the acid, the pH? Yeah, the acid, yeah, exactly. Okay, after that, we have some paprika. You can buy the smoky paprika, the Hungarian one, or just regular good old American. Mm -hmm. A little bit of cayenne and a little bit because it could be, could be hard. Some dark chili powder. Mm. So you gotta go heavy on that. Obviously your salt and pepper. And last but not least, some cumin. Cumin is coriander seeds that are toasted and then ground. Lots and lots of great flavor. So. Now this is a typical Peruvian dish? Uh, it's more like, Caribbean, Central American, but yeah. I mean, we yeah we eat a lot of pork in Peru. Yeah. In Peru, we use a, another pepper too. It's a smoky pepper called panca, mm -hmm. but this has a lot of flavor. Yeah, so, two chefs in the kitchen. So we have the piece of pork tenderloin that it's as I said it's been marinated, but I'll just keep it in there for a minute. So can we turn that up, sure. the burner on? Yeah. Just do it at like four hundred. I've never worked with this burner, so I'm hoping that I'm put set the place on fire. So. Now, Chef, uh, you know, we have a time lapse going here on the marinade. How long would you recommend this? At be? least an hour. Okay. I mean, it could be as long as, because vinegar is going to cook your product. Right. You know, anything with vinegar, lemon, is like a cooking method. So two hours, three hours at the most. If that, you can just remove it. I mean, all the spices and the coatings will be there, too. Okay. Great. All right. Yeah, so Chef just gave you another tip. You know, a ceviche is made with lemon juice and they'll do shrimp, scallops, fish. Yeah, shrimp is usually cooked, so the shrimp, you know, it's just like a lightly toss. But with fish, I mean, really, like 20 minutes, 10 cool. minutes. I mean, in South America, it's to water. <laughs> it's like really raw with that lime, lime flavor. But, you know, if people want it a little more cooked, I will say, 10 to 15 minutes top, so because the fish will really eat up that, that citrus right. big time. And that's the cooking method, the citrus, it's the pH. Okay, chef. Is it hot? It's that red hot, yeah. Are you sure? Stick your finger in there, you'll find out. No, it's not hot enough. Okay. Uh, we all, I always talk about this, do not be afraid to get that pan smoking hot. So while the pork is cooking, we are going to have a couple other things. I have here about 
cup of maybe no, maybe three quarters of a cup of cooked white rice. Any parboiled rice is good. Yeah. We have some stewed black beans here. So I'm gonna heat up a little pan here. So you are cooking. Do you have a rice preference to use a basmati? Uh, I love jas uh, jasmine rice. Jasmine, yeah. okay. Jasmine rice will be my okay. favorite. But jasmine oh, rice has oh, to be eaten oh, after you cook it. Don't reheat it. Just make it in a burrito or something, but it has to be, it's hard to reheat. Jasmine rice just turns into, into mush, mush, you know? Okay. Yeah. All right, so in another pan here, we have some chopped garlic. Garlic. You just want it golden. Do not let it burn because once that garlic burns, it's going to ruin your whole dish. All right, Joe is right. But you want it to be a little brown. Though. You don't want it to be raw. The minute you can smell it, you know. And if the pan is hot, that's the key. I mean, usually in the restaurant, the pans are so hot. The minute you throw the garlic, it gets crazy. So we've cooked this black beans with carrots and red on and onions and water. And all the spices right here, the same thing, cumin, salt, pepper, and paprika. The trick is when you cook your black beans from scratch, per se, you have them soaked in water overnight or for a few hours. You throw your garlic, your onion, your carrot, you saute that until they're nice and cooked. Then you throw the dry black beans then at that particular time, you throw also all your spices. So that way, the, the, the oil that is in the pan is gonna coat the beans, and then you throw your water. Usually, three to one ratio with beans, because the beans take a little longer to cook. And the spices really eat up on the, with the oil. I mean, almost like, it's like a toasty flavor with, uh, with the beans. So these beans are pretty much done. And after the beans are completely cooked, you get a, like a potato musher, and then you mush them a little bit, because you want them to be softer, so you can mix them with the rice. But you still and this is what comes out. So, you, so the beans are a little bit like, almost like refried, but they're not like completely, there's still some whole. So that way, when you make the cake, they stick together. Okay. okay. Anybody knows, you know, plantains are the, the big, bright green, you know, island bananas that are hard as a rock when they're really green. But when they're completely black, people think, oh, we gotta throw this away. No, actually, you peel them and they're so sweet. They taste, I think they're much better than the, the tostones, which are like the dry ones. To me, those have no flavor. Well, in the same pan that we're doing the pork, I'm just gonna heat this up a little bit. Now, when you peel these plantains, yeah. Are, do they need to be cooked at that point when they're no. really ripe? Well, when, when they're, yeah, when they're ripe, yes. Okay. When they're raw, you have to slice them, or actually you cut them and then you have to pound them, cook right. them, and then pound them again because, and to me they have no more, not a lot of flavor. Right. You see how the brown sugar has made like a little caramelization too, so it's nice and coated? Okay. Now, Chef, when, when you're doing this pork, do you go for a medium, medium rare, or what do you uh, recommend? I love medium rare. Right. Pork, most people will go medium right. or medium well, yeah. depending on the cut. I think the tenderloin is very tender. It's actually one of my favorite cuts of pork. I, I'm not a big fan of pork chops because I think they dry out a little bit. Yeah. Um, the key thing with a piece of meat too is you cook it and then you let it rest so all the juices sort of like stay in. Yeah. We're burning the, the plantains? No, we're not. Right, we're gonna turn this one off. Okay. okay, so now we're going to sort of complete the dish. I'm gonna make the, the taku taku, the, the black bean cake. So we're gonna wait for this little zzz to go away. We'll go from the other one, okay? And you're actually letting it rust in the pan. Correct, yes, okay. yes. Quick question, and you can share this with our viewing audience and our guests. In a kitchen, you're not sticking a thermometer in there. You're doing no. it by touch, correct? Correct, yeah. So, so Right. I always like this technique yeah. where each finger has a different feel in the muscle. And, you know, for a really raw, rare, rather, first finger thumb, 
If that field matches this, then it's going to be rare. Medium rare, medium, and then well done, because that muscle tightens up. So, we've decided to change over one of our induction burners, which we normally use, because Chef needs a Teflon pan to finish this dish. Is that correct? That is correct. Great. Again, a little olive oil in the pan. Yeah. And the reason why the Teflon pan is just because you want it, you don't want this to stick. You want every little piece to come out. Right. So a couple of minutes, maybe about a minute for the oil to heat up. All right. Well, while that's heating up, Chef, I just want to ask you a question. You know, it, depending on what the chef is trying to accomplish, but if you are using olive oil, just remember it has a very low smoke uh, temperature as opposed to a canola or a different type of cooking oil. I like olive oil. I cook with it a lot because I want that additional flavor. So I make sure I'm watching the heat of that oil. And I don't know if that's what you're looking for, Chef. It's, is it a flavor? Uh, it is, yeah. I mean, olive oil has a great flavor. And you want to add your flavors. The oil is going to reflect what you're cooking. If you're cooking right. in peanut oil, it's going to be like peanuts. It's, you know what I'm saying? It yeah. definitely has that. Right. So trying to mold this. And the reason why it's also a small pan like that is you can cover the bottom of it. And, you know, and... And what is the Peruvian name for this? Well, taku taku is a, taku -taku. a rice and bean mixture. It's, it was a, a leftover type of thing, the big rice and bean pots, you know. Yeah. What are we going to do with this? I mean, and because it's made in this type of pan, you actually can flip it and make like an omelet. And South of Mesa with all kinds of seafood inside. I mean, it's, wow. and you know, you have no eggs or nothing. Yeah. So. That's, that's great. So what you're trying to accomplish here is to get a crust on the bottom of this, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. So the tricky part, which you got to be careful when you do this at home, um, you know, it's like you're going to flip it and then you see like it came into the other side. I mean. It, well, it's a lot easier than you think, and you know, yeah, with yeah. the way they train you is you do it with actually like beans or something, you know, like, and I do it with my left hand, look, and I'm a right-handed person. I can't do it with my right hand. But I, I want to make a point here for the home chef, okay? He does this quite a bit. If you take a plate a little bit bigger than the saute that you have, put that on top, and then just turn it over, and then you can... Once that's on your plate, just slide it back into the pan. And, you know, you don't have to have it falling off the ceiling on some poor guy's head. All right, so we're gonna finally put this dish together. And one term that we use in restaurants a lot is called the vehicle. So the vehicle is like, like the mashed potato or the rice bean cake, which will go on the bottom of the plate you know, so that you start piling the food on top. Right. So you got your pork, yeah. and again, one more trick for the pork. You see the grain going down this way? Yeah. So you gotta cut against it, okay? This is gonna be nice and medium rare for me. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, you know, we always talk about smell-o-vision. Everything smells wonderful. Okay. Then you have your few plantain pieces. And then we have the most, another delicious pickled onions. Oh, lovely. Now you make your own pickled onions. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and more cilantro, just for color. Yeah. And I actually brought a, another sauce. And we got a little red pepper panka sauce here, just for this dish. A little messy. Mm -hmm. And then you just sort of like... And that's it. Little, always want to garnish the plate with a little paprika. Right. Oh, it looks absolutely beautiful, Chef. There you go. Very good. Great job, Chef. <laughs> Chef, quick question. If, if the person does not eat a meat or chicken and will eat fish, what, a scallop 
Uh, fish grilled dish. shrimp will be perfect. Okay. Any fish, grouper, swordfish, tuna, any, any fish really. I mean, any fish would be perfect right. with it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, and then if you didn't, if you were a pure vegetarian, you could add what to it? You, you have... You can add grilled zucchini, yeah. asparagus, Excellent. sugar snap peas. Yeah. I mean, anything that has, you want to have contrast in flavors. Something has to be crunchy, something has to be soft. Right. You know, something has to have like a smoky flavor, a milder flavor. There's sweet, there's tangy, there's soft, there's meat this heat, and we're done. Great. <laughs> Chef, this has been a great presentation. Thank you. And if you want to, again, go to the Chef's Table series TV website, you can actually re-watch the show, and the recipe is posted on the website so that you can do exactly what the chef did. Okay. Uh, so I am now going to... Thank Make food you. for you guys, and we can all have fun and have a glass of wine. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Carol. Right. Thank you, Frank. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's wine pairing. I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host of the Chef's Table series, and I am here with wine manager and wine sommelier, John Paul Kaminga of Blanchett's Wines and Spirits. So he has chosen a wine that will be paired with Masona Grill's dishes that he made today on the show. So he made two dishes, mm. one with shrimp with a spice to it as well as a pork dish. Yeah. And I gave you the task of finding just one wine that will go with both those dishes. I think, I think we might have found it. Yeah. I've, I think I've had this uh, shrimp dish before uh, from Manny because I, I get to work with him every uh, month with a, a wine dinner we do oh, with him. Oh, that's right, he does, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think this will, will be pretty interesting. It's a dry semillon from Hunter Valley in uh, Australia. Um, oh. And although everybody thinks of Australia as making these kind of big, uh, spicy red wines mm -hmm. like Shiraz, um, it's not really their most unique wine, uh, Shiraz. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, probably their most unique wine is Hunter Valley Semillon, which most people have never heard of. Yep. So, you want to give it a try? Let's give it a try. All yeah. right. Yeah, Manny's food is excellent. He, yeah. he takes like dishes and he adds his own spices and his Peruvian influences because he's from Peru. Yeah, how many times have you seen Peruvian, a Peruvian restaurant? Yeah, not that often. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Floral? It is a little bit floral. Mm. It's distinctly lemony to me, like very yeah. lemony and kind of like a little beeswax and that floral oh, kind of smell. Oh, I need to swirl it a little bit more then. <laughs> But it's very lemon and lime. Um, it's so, so citrusy. Mm -hmm. um, so and for an Australian wine, is yeah. extremely low in alcohol. It's 11% alcohol, um, which for actually, any dry wine was, would be very, very low. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things that makes this unique. Oh, that's good. So people can drink more than one. Yeah, you can, <laughs> well, I don't know. It's just, it's interesting. Oftentimes, if you don't, if you don't have the flavor of the mm. alcohol, you can notice the other flavors mm -hmm. more. So it's, it's kind of, when you get a fully flavored wine that is lower in alcohol, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. You know what? This will go very well. Mm. It's going to complement. Mm. It won't overpower. It kinda, I think so. I yeah. feel like the wine will weave through the spices as well as the fish and the, um, yep. the meat together. Nothing that he had was too hot or spicy. And I think, although this is really high in acidity and doesn't yeah. have any sugariness to it, mm -hmm. it's going to help to complement and just kind of act as a refreshing beverage. And it, you know, it's kind of tough to do a pork dish and a shrimp dish with one wine, but I think I know. This so I always do give them very challenging yeah. tasks okay. to do. But um, no, you did a good job. Cool. Excellent. Well, John Paul, chink with me. Cheers. Good job. Cheers. So everyone, this has been the wine pairing for Missona Grill's two dishes, the pork and shrimp, and we will see you next week. Hi folks, Steve LeCount, chef owner of Chiara Bistro in Westwood, coming at you with this week's chef's tip. Uh, this week I'd like to talk a little bit about knife safety and cutting safety, and that's why I have a, a carrot and a parsnip in front of, front of me. Um, basically, I'm going to peel this really quickly and then show you a few different cuts and how you can do them in a, in a safe manner. And the reason I picked both of these vegetables is because of their shape. 
And most home cooks uh, who don't have professional knife skills, uh, when they do cut their finger, it's usually slicing a round vegetable of some sort, like a carrot or a parsnip, uh, which makes sense. I mean, they roll around on the cutting board, and next thing you know, your knife is not on the carrot, it's on your finger. So, we'll just put that aside a little bit. Now I'm using a, a typical French knife here for this. Uh, important to have a very sharp knife when you're doing a firm vegetable like that. So I want to cut the ends off of these. And then we'll show you a few different cuts. And I'm going to start with, now, to eliminate most of the danger, one of the best things you can do is just take a little slice off of that, and now you've got a flat surface to rest that on. So if you want carrot wheels for something, you know, you've got a little bit of leverage there instead of that thing rolling around on you. Uh, if I want to cut carrot sticks, I still have that leverage because it's flat, and I can do things like that, and then just pile them on top of each other and cut my carrot sticks. Let's say I want to finely dice that for some reason. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing. Take a little piece off. Let that flat side. I'm just going to cut these thinner now. And then stack a couple of them together. And notice, notice the uh, motion. I'm not, I'm not cutting down like this, which I see a lot of home cooks doing. It's actually a rocking motion. I'm starting at the, the front part of this knife and I'm pushing forward like that. Okay? It's, as I'm doing, I'm tucking these four fingers, bending them so my knuckles are resting against the blade of that knife. And that's what's keeping me from cutting the tips of my left fingers off. So once I have them finely diced like that, I just turn that sideways. And now I'll go a little bit faster. And you can still see that rocking motion. Again, I'm not doing this. I'm pushing forward, and then I'm moving the knife sideways and doing it again. Sideways, doing it again. And it's that easy to dice it, things that small. And let me just get these shavings out of the way. And I'm going to show you a bias cut next. Uh, again, we have the carrot sticks, a couple of rounds, the fine dice. And I'll take this parsnip, we'll do a, a bias cut. So I'm going, to, I'm going to notice I'm just putting that, I'm using that tip of that knife right there. You should be able to see that pretty well. And I'm just pushing down and then pushing down. And that's my nice flat surface. And I'm going to angle cut this. Okay, into pieces like that. A nice bias cut. This looks nice in stews and you know maybe with a roast chicken or something like that. But again, using that same, I just have to pick the knife up a little higher because of the height of the parsnip itself, but I'm still using that same rocking motion all the way through to the end of this. So there you go. Nice lots of shapes, all of it done very quickly, but most importantly, very safely, and all my fingers are intact. Steve LeCan with this week's Chef's Tip of the Week. Due to popular demand, we are going to re-air one of our most popular Chef's Tips of the Week segments. Hi folks, Steve LeCount, Chef Owner of Chiara Bistro in Westwood, coming at you this week with this week's Chef's Tip of the Week. This week I want to talk about a piece of equipment that I find totally invaluable at the restaurant. Um, for relatively short money, you can buy one of these. They come in smaller sizes as well for the home use, uh, but it's called a food mill. And the reason we, we love it so much is we have a signature dish that's a potato gnocchi on there. And these food mills come with, usually with a set of three different dies. This is the largest one. Um, and then there's a little spring-loaded blade here. So when you put that die in, you want that curved side facing up. And then you just place the blade in, into the hole in the center. And this is why the spring is there. You push down on this and hook it on, onto these little hooks. And from there, it's as easy as one, two, three. Um, what I love about this is, again, we make our potato gnocchi with them. This is what we pass our potatoes through. And, but there are many, many uses for this. You can do it for butternut squash, cooked pumpkin, uh, anything that carrots, whatever you like to have a, make a puree out of. Um, you could put a finer dye in there. 
uh, with smaller holes if you want that puree to be totally smooth. But today I'm going to show you mashed potatoes because people often ask, uh, you know, how do you get those potatoes so smooth? Mine always have lumps in them. And I've got some cooked right behind me. And when we make mashed potatoes, uh, we like to use uh, Idaho potatoes because they have, uh, naturally have a less of a water content. And you see my potatoes have no water in here right now. I did boil these, uh, but I also, after I drain them, I put them back in the pot, put the burner on low, and let, let most of the water evaporate out of those, which is kind of important. You're getting nice, fluffy, smooth potatoes. So I'm going to scoop those into this food mill. And this food mill comes with a little hook here. And you just hook that onto the pot like that. And from there, you just grab this handle and you just crank the handle. And it, and it passes, it basically it mills the food through the holes in the die. And it's really that easy. Now, I have, behind me, I've also heated up some a little bit of light cream and whole butter that I've put into the light cream and just scrape the excess off there. Okay, so that's what it comes out looking like. Not a lump in this. So I'm going to season those a little bit, salt and pepper. My butter is already in, in the cream. I'm just going to add a little as I need it. And then just all I have to do from there is stir. Now, today we all have food processors. It's one of the worst things you can ever try to make mashed potatoes with, and I'll tell you why. Potatoes have natural gluten in them. It's just like flour. If you overwork it, uh, that gluten, um, it ends up being, the gluten is just what forms like elas elasticity in do bread doughs. And potatoes have quite, quite a bit of natural gluten in there. So the more you move the potatoes around, the more that gluten you're activating, and you're going to end up with a gummy, stretchy kind of potato. So if you ever try to do it in a food processor for mashed potatoes, I guarantee you they're going to come out like glue. Uh, where these are nice and fluffy, they haven't got a lump in them, smooth as silk. And I'm going to go eat these right now. So Steve LeCount from Chiara Bistro in Westwood with this week's Chef's Tip of the Week. Thanks. Hi, I'm Marjorie Gann and I work at Ethos in Jamaica Plain and we're an organization that serves elders and people of all ages with disabilities. I'm a registered dietitian, a wife and a mom and I've been doing it for 30 years so I have some practical ideas on how to bring good nutrition into your home. And one of the basis of good nutrition is portion size. And the other day the, I had that whole concept brought home to me because I was making a recipe that called for two cups of flour same recipe that I've made forever, except this time I was making it from a 1950s cookbook where it told me that the yield was going to be 12 scones, whereas my 1980s cookbook recipe said it was going to yield eight. That's a pretty big difference in portion size. So I started thinking, well, that really is one of our problems in the U.S. So I want to talk a little bit about what portion sizes are and how we can affect them. So if we look at soda or tonic, if you happen to be from Massachusetts, we can buy a 90 calorie can, we can buy a 12 ounce 140 calorie can, or the 12 ounce 140 calorie bottle. Now what's really interesting is that if you look at the 12 ounce can and the bottle, which are really the same size, they really don't look the same. I think that, frankly, for my, in my opinion, the bottle looks bigger. If you're buying the very large bottle, the serving size on the back is 12 ounces, so the same as the can and the larger bottle. And that really goes back to what is a portion size. The FDA has determined that 12 ounces is in fact the portion size for soda. But when it comes in a smaller single serving can, you actually use the single can as the serving size. So a little bit confusing? Absolutely. But it does make a difference because we're talking 50 calories here. Does it sound like a lot? Maybe not. But if you're someone who's drinking, say, four cans a day, which is not unusual, that's pretty significant. Another example of how you can get helped in the portion category is you can buy your animal crackers in the large category. Now this holds 65 servings. 
I don't know about you, but I have a terrible time figuring out what 1 65th is of anything. This is actually what 1 65th looks like. It's actually 28 animal crackers. Or you have the option of buying a single serving packet. These are about the same number of calories, about 110, 120. And it, this one's certainly easier to watch your calories. You buy one, you take one out of the package, there it is, ready to go. Here the temptation is of course to increase the number of cookies. So when it comes to cookies, one ounce as a serving size. When it comes to meat, which by the way, meats are not labeled for a serving size because they're a fresh food, we're looking at the size of a deck of cards. So here we have a deck of cards. You can see it's about, what, three and a half, four inches by about three quarters of an inch. The other way to think of that is palm of your hand and about that thick. Fruits and vegetables are, as fresh foods, don't come with portion sizes either. But if you look at the nutrition facts, they're going to come with about a half a cup or 100 grams. If we were going to weigh this apple, we'd find that an apple this size, which is pretty typical, actually weighs exactly right on the mark 200 grams. Most of us would never consider this apple to be two servings, but it is. And by the way, this is rice, serving size of a half a cup. Not very much. Most people would go, where's the rest? But if you're looking then at what the government says servings should be, Currently, the government uses something called MyPlate. MyPlate is trying to wean us away from animal foods. So here's the dairy, small, the protein, which is small, a lot of vegetables, fruits, and grains. Well, what does this mean? There's no serving size here. So for that, we can go back to the pyramid. And the pyramid is probably the last one that the uh, federal government issued. And here we're talking how many servings. So we could be talking for the base of the pyramid, six to 11 servings of grains. Well, people will say, well, I couldn't possibly eat 11. Well, you're not talking, we're not talking 11 large servings. We're talking something the equivalent of the half cup of rice, a small slice of bread, and so on. And again, it keeps going up with what is a serving. So if you're going to utilize these tools, which by the way, are available on the web, you'll find that you really need that background of what's a serving. So I hope I've helped you today understand what a serving is. I'm Marjorie Gann. Thanks for joining us here at the Chef's Table Series and that's your healthy nutrition tip for today. Hi, I'm Marjorie Gann and I work at Ethos in Jamaica Plain and we're an organization that serves elders and people of all ages with disabilities. We're also the nutrition provider for Southwest Boston, so we serve Meals on Wheels, community cafes, and provide in-home nutrition consultation. I've been a registered dietitian, wife and mom for over 30 years, so I've developed some pretty good nutrition tips to help that are practical and easy to do. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about sodium. Sodium is half of salt, which is actually sodium chloride, and it's estimated that in the United States, people eat about, say, give or take, 2,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Now the Institute of Medicine says it should only be 1,500. And for people who eat a lot of salt, which probably would be males around 30, you're actually talking as much as, say, 4,000 milligrams. So here's a little quiz. Here are three foods, and they have different amounts of sodium. Which food on this table is the saltiest? Is it the hamburger bun, my little chocolate cupcake, or the ounce of potato chips. And I will bet that 80% of you will say it's the potato chips. But being sneaky, these are actually the lowest sodium food on this table. This is an ounce of potato chips. These happen to be a reduced fat potato chip which have less salt on them. So these come in at 85 milligrams for this size serving. The cupcake, and this is a pretty little cupcake if you look at it, 135 milligrams, and you'd probably eat both of the ones that came in the package. And the hamburger bun is the surprise because that's got 220 milligrams of sodium. So if you add into this the hamburger, the french fries, and probably maybe four tablespoons of ketchup, we're really looking at 1,000 milligrams in this one meal versus the Institute of Medicine's recommendation of 1,500 milligrams for the entire day. So you can see why those 30-year-old men are getting their excess sodium. So the easiest ways to cut down on sodium 
probably eat fewer processed foods, lots more fresh fruits and vegetables. And that's my tip for the day. I'm Marjorie Gann, and I'm here for Chef's Table. Thank you for joining me. Hello everyone and welcome to the restaurant interview segment of the Chef's Table series. I am here with chef owner Manny Sifnagal at Masona Grill in West Roxbury. So Manny, thanks for being on the segment with me today. You're very welcome. So Manny, tell us about your culinary background and how you started being a chef. Well, it started at home actually. Um, yeah. you know, coming from Peru where food is so abundant and rich and mm -hmm. delicious, uh, I was cooked at home and when I came here back in 1981, I wow. had to cook it for myself. Yeah. So I worked in several restaurants, you know, cutting fish, doing this, doing that. And here it goes. I ended up going to hotel and food management school at BU and right. had jobs through various places in the city. Mm -hmm. Now you owned back in the day your own restaurant in the city, correct? Correct, yes. I opened the Claremont Cafe, which was my first restaurant mm -hmm. in 1992, right mm -hmm. on the south end, small little place. It was open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. Oh, man. There was always someone working in there. Yep. And it closed in 2005. I sold it in mm -hmm. 2005. I also had Cafe 300 in the Four Point Channel area. Yep, I remember that. From 94 to 2004. So I was kind of like a pioneer of spaces way before they were really happening. Right. The South End had five restaurants, and Four Point Channel, that area, had three restaurants. Right. Now the South End has over 75 restaurants <laughs> and Four Point has almost 25 restaurants, yes, which is the hottest space in, exactly. in the city it's right like now. Exactly, it's like popped, exactly. So tell me about the concept around your restaurant now, Masona Grill. So I sold the business in 05 and mm -hmm. I told myself that it will be at least a year before I will do anything else. And obviously mm -hmm. I closed the deal on September 11th of 2005. October 1st of 2005, yep. I bought this place. Oh, wow. So it was only three weeks. Yep. And I talked to the landlord, and he gave us plenty of help. And my daughter was babysitting around here, and she was telling me how the people that she would babysit were going to Weston Center, and there was a two-hour wait. So people in the area were eager for new places yes. for, to have dinner. So we were able to open in July of 06, mm -hmm. due to the fact that there was a lot of work to be done in here. Right, And sure. like adding bathrooms and mm -hmm. connecting spaces. And here we are, still here. Wow, you know, Manny, that's enjoying. so 2006? Yeah. Oh my God, a couple more years, you'll be celebrating 10 years here. Yes, we will. Now can, tell me, tell everyone about the name Masona, how you came up with that, which I love this, so, I love this story. So Masona Grill stands for my three daughters' first letters on their names, mm -hmm. Marcella is the M-A, Sofia is the S-O, and Natalia is the N-A, so Masona. I also like the sound, it sounds like Maison in French, or Mansion, or Masona, which is a big house in yeah. Spanish. Well, it does and, feel like a house here. It's yeah, very warm. and it is very warm and inviting. Eclectic with the, the lamps and the pictures, yes. I love it. So tell us about your cuisine here. I don't want to say it's strictly Peru Peruvian. It's different than that, right? No, it is influenced by Peruvian cuisine, obviously, okay. but we do have pasta, we do have a lot of fish, mm -hmm. we, we have pork, steak, chicken, lamb. We do have a lot of specials that go with the season. We do change our menu seasonably, Perfect. or at least three times a year. Sometimes yeah. fall and winter can be almost under the same category, <laughs> True. or it could be a little longer, four, mm -hmm. four, four and a half months instead of like the three months. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do get availability for products pretty much year-round nowadays. I know you Obviously, some things taste better when it's in season, but like tomatoes, per se. You know? Right. But other than that, I mean, pretty much you, if you, you can cook them right, they will taste like something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what dishes do you tend to keep on the menu because of your repeat customers that always work? Well, we always have to have a type of ceviche because it's mm -hmm. a very popular Peruvian dish. Mm -hmm. We. One of the most popular dishes in here is the eggplant romana, which is completely an Italian dish. Oh, it's like an eggplant parm yep. that, you know, it's been around for the last six or seven years that we cannot take it off the menu. <laughs> uh, it all started back in 2008 yep. when the economy was not doing so well and we introduced a, like a bistro menu from like 5 to 6.30. I, I remember that. And that dish came on and people, people were raving about it and 
finally, when the economy got better, like in 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. we f got rid of the bistro menu, and we kept that item on the menu, but it was a little more money. And people really enjoy it. That's good. That's great. Now, I also noticed that it's bigger in here. It seems bigger. Did you do some um, renovations in here? Yeah. Especially we, upstairs. Yes. So throughout the eight years that we've been here, we've actually expanded twice. One was uh, almost six months after we opened. Right. We expanded to a smaller area where we extended the bar. Mm -hmm. And recently, as last year in October, we added another 12 seats and made the bar a couple of more Longer. seats as well. Yeah. And it's great. It's you awesome. know, there's a demand for it. Weekends, you definitely need a reservation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're having fun. That's good. How many seats do you have? We have oh. about 50 seats. Yeah. 50 seats? Yeah. And the bar has about... The it's bar has about 12. That's really good. Yeah. It's excellent. Okay, last question. What are your three signature ingredients that you use consistently to make your dishes? Consistently, you yes. have to have cilantro, yes. ginger, red onion. Oh. Red onion, vinegar, lime juice. Yep. Put key, together. Key, key ingredients, yes. Perfect. All right. Well, Danny, thanks for being on the segment with me today. You're very welcome. Excellent. So everyone, this has been the restaurant interview segment of the Chef's Table Series. I'm here with Manny of Masona Grill, and we will see you next week. All right, so we're lightly tossing it just so we can see where it's distributed. If you add the mayo first, then the mayo will hold on to a certain particular product, and it will just be all avocado on the side and all beef. So just mix it up first, That's so that way, great tip, so Jeffy. that way, you know, like you um you are really spreading it around and you see what you're going to throw the mayo in. But you got to be careful when you do this at home. You know, it's like you're going to flip it and then you see like it came into the other side. I mean, yeah. it, well, it's a lot easier than you think. And you know, with the way they trained you is you do it with actually like beans or something, you know, like, and I do it with my left hand, look, and I'm a right-handed person. The Chef's Table Series is shooting on location in cities and towns across Massachusetts. If you would like to suggest your favorite restaurant or attend a live taping of the show, please visit thechefstableseries.tv.